Make sure your Bible stay open to John chapter 6. If you need the notes, again, as usual, just hold your hand up. The men are ready to serve you with those. Again, a very familiar passage. Great story. Great miracle. Feeding of the 5,000 men. Again, it's 5,000 men, so you throw in the ladies and the kids, you've got a great, great number. So tonight we're looking as much as they would, as much as they would, and I've tacked on that all may know. Don't worry, we're not going to be pushing this type message over and over throughout the year, but it's helped set the tone for us as we go into Country Harvest Sundays, we go into the fall and into the Christmas season, we really need to be focused on this idea that all may know. Uh, that's what God left us here for, that's what we need to remind us, so we need to go ahead and just grab it, just accept that concept. Now, some of you be... Uh, talking to some of you in the near future about different opportunities and challenging us all. Take those next steps that all may know. So we're looking at this very simple story, a very amazing story, and then we're going to apply it to our theme that all may know. I love that little phrase, as much as they would. As much as they would. I was pre preaching part of this to uh, kids in a Christian school this week, and I was wrong. That means even the teenage boys got as much as they wanted. Uh, and that's a lot. And that's saying something that says, no, I don't want any more. My son, uh, who was, uh, when he was a teenager, he had to pack a lunch to go from the din dinner table to the refrigerator. It was that bad. I mean, it was just amazing how much he He worked between jobs. He'd work in a couple of part-time jobs, and he'd eat for a snack a dozen donuts and a gallon of that little orange juice stuff. Just an oh, just amazing, amazing amount. So as much as they would. So we're thinking about this idea of the miracle that God provides and working here that all may hear. The thought of it tonight, the very simple thought as we look at it, is the fact that as we sing the song, little is much when God is in it. Little is much when God is in it. So I'll preach it myself tonight and trust it spills over onto you and that you get a hold of this thing. As well, I'll get a hold of it. Little is much when God is in it. We have a little lad as a focus point. A little bit of faith. A little lunch, but a great work. Little things put in the hands of God accomplishes great, great things. Aren't you glad God takes little things and gives us a great output? God's not limited to the size of what we give back to Him. He's not limited by, well, if you just gave me more, I could do more. No, God can do anything with what we give Him. That's why in 1 Corinthians 1.26, I think it's in your notes, For we see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty, and base things of the world, and things that are despised hath God chosen, yea, things that are not, to bring not to things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God loves using little things, things that have no consequence of themselves, using them to do great things so that he gets the glory. Oh, what a wonderful thing. That's why in 1 Samuel 14, 6, And Jonathan said to the young man that bare his armor, Come, let us go over unto the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us, for there is no restraint to the Lord to save by many or by you. God doesn't need a great host. God can use just a few. In fact, in Judges 7, 2, and I almost preached on this passage, with Gideon. Remember, Gideon started out with thousands, and God took him down to 300. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. He said, I'm not going to do it with that crowd. You've got too many around. You've got too many on your side. You've got too many laborers. You've got too many soldiers. Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand hath saved me. God wants to take the little things, the despised things, the insignificant things, and do great to it, so he gets the glory, and we can praise him for it. So tonight, as we look at this idea, instead of saying, Well, we've got just a little church, and so we can only do just a little bit, let's not focus on the size, the little size of our church, but on the size of our God. How God can do 
and focus what God can do with the small church. They ate as much as they would. God took those little fishes, those little sardines, those few crackers, and fed the 15, 20,000, however you want to, we can calculate how much was there with 5,000 men, and they all took as much as they would. He took a little bit and did a great miraculous work. I'm glad God can take a little work and do a great work with it. Do you believe that tonight? Do you believe a revival can begin with us and spread to our valley and spread to our state? It started with the 120 in the upper room and changed the world. God can take the 120 here and change the world also. They, that 120, they changed the world. And I got news for you, they didn't have a copy machine among them. There was not a cell phone in the bunch. There was not an iPad. There was not a, a radio. Hello? And yet God used that little bunch to spread the gospel around the world. So if we want to bring a spiritual awakening to the East Bay, if that's what we want God to do through us and God to use us far, we are just primed for that. These few fishes and few loaves, God can do that. With these few fishes and these few loaves, God can bring a spiritual awakening to the East Bay. Amen. So let's look at this tonight, these miracles, these thoughts, and you grab a hold of what you need tonight. I'll grab a hold of what I need tonight, but we'll focus with the general direction of the fact that all may know God taking a little and doing a great work. But we're going to learn tonight how that is. You can apply it to many areas of your life, to areas of your family, but we want to apply it to the church as well. So number one we find, as we look at this, the, the Lord of the miracle. The Lord of the miracle. By the way, miracle is going to come from God. It's not going to come from my ideas. It's not going to come from my preaching. It's not going to come from you doing things. It's going to come from the Lord. And we look at the story, it's obvious God did this. It's obvious Jesus multiplied the fishes. God multiplied uh, the, the bread and did a great work. So they took all that they would. So the Lord of the miracle. And in this miracle, we see God posed a problem with a purpose. He posed a problem with a purpose. Look at verse number 5. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered him, Two hundred penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, that every one of them may take a little. He posed a problem. He brought up the problem. He pointed out the problem, but he pointed out the problem because the problem and what he was pointing out had a purpose. Had a purpose. By the way, I'm glad God really doesn't have any problems. Yeah. Nothing he can't handle, nothing he can't solve, but he posed a problem. He came and says, what are we going to do? He looked at the multitude and says, how are we going to feed these folks? How are we going to do it? But when God brings a problem to your life, when God brings a problem to my life, when God allows a problem to my life, when God allows a problem to your life, it's got a purpose for it. Oh, I'm so glad that we don't have to say, well, this is just a waste. No, it's not a waste. God has got a purpose for our problems. Very quickly, 1 Peter 1, 7. That the trial of your faith, I'm talking about when, the tri when your faith gets tried, how much you believe in God, how much you trust God, how much you believe this book, how much you think we can make up through it, the trial of your faith, being much more precious than that of gold that perish it, though be tried with fire, might be found under the praise of honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Listen, if there's nothing, if there's no other reason for your problem, is that God gets glory when he comes. Oh, when we just have, can't, when the trial comes and we can't bear up, but he lifts us up and bears us up, when we don't see how we're going to make it, but he delivers it through it, we can, at that time, when he comes back, it'll be his praise, honor, and glory. By the way, that's how we're supposed to live, for his glory, always. So, the problems come, it's for his glory. His praise, His honor, and His glory. So the next time you say, boy, i got a problem, you stop and think, all right, how is God going to work this for His praise? How is God going to work this for His honor? See, that's why when the problems come, you can't do anything dishonorable. Just stay right. Just keep doing right. It's, I said it so many times, but it means so much in my life. It's never right to do wrong to do right. Did you hear what I said? It's never right to do wrong to do right. It's not right to rob a bank to give to poor people. Hello? It's not right to lie to keep somebody out of trouble. 
It's never right to do wrong to do right. So when problems come, it's never right to do wrong. You say, well, you don't understand. I mean, no, it's never right to do wrong to do right. Why? Because even with the problems, we find them to praise and honor. If we get through a trial dishonorably, that's no honor to Christ. If we get through a trial by cheating, if we get through a trial by dishonesty, if we get through a trial by being unchristian, that is not honoring to God. But when we go through with His power and His grace, then it's for His praise, His honor, and His glory. So when the problems come and Jesus allows a problem, presents a problem, think about, okay, God, how is this going to be for your praise? Not, I'm so good, I made it. No, what did God do with honor and glory? James 1, 2. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers' temptation, knowing this, that the trying your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that you may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. God doesn't bring problems into our life to make us quit, but to seek Him. He doesn't bring problems into our life to make us panic, but to believe. He has purposes. Are you listening? Purposes for His problem. Look what it says there again in our text, in verse number 5. When Jesus lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he saith unto Philip, When shall we buy bread for these that these may eat? And this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. So he brings the problem because he already knows what he's going to do with it. So he had purposes for the problem. He said, what, what, pro what purpose did he have in this passage? To test faith. He wanted to prove Philip. So I want to see what you're going to do. Are you going to panic? Are you Are going to give up? You're going to do something un untrustworthy? The test is faith. Your problem comes, my problem comes, many times the test faith. Number two, his purpose was to meet a need. He said, we got a problem, we got to feed these folks. There's a need there. So many times God brings problems into our lives to meet a need in somebody else's life. Hello? So, well, I don't know why God put me in the hospital. God knows why he puts you in the hospital. Well, I don't know why I lost my job and why I'm standing in this unemployment line. God knows why you're in a standing in an unemployment line. The purposes of the problem here? To test faith. Number two, to meet a great need. Number three, I believe to bless the lad. <laughs> the Bible doesn't tell us what they did with the other 12 baskets, but I assume he got at least one. We'll find at the end of this, to save souls. To save souls. Oh, the purposes of the problem. So, we have to look at our problem. When God presents us problems, and by the way, as a church, He will. He will. There'll be times there just won't be enough money. There'll be times there won't be enough workers. There's lots of times there's not enough hours in a day. There'll be difficulties. There'll be criticisms. There'll be people complaining. There'll be people mocking. There'll be all those things. But God brings these problems in, but not so we can have problems but so we can test our faith, so we can meet a need to bless us and to see souls saved. So, we have to go, the idea is we have to understand it's not our sufficiency. It's not our ability. It's not, it's all on Him. So we find the Lord of the miracle poses a problem with a purpose. Why? That all may know. In this case, that they would have as much as they would. To take something little and do a great thing with it. But he had to bring the problem first. So you have a problem, take it to the Lord, and we'll find what he can do with it. Number two, number one, the Lord of the miracle. Oh, if we're going to see God do a work and reach the Bay Area, that all may know it's going to be by the Lord. Number two, we see the land of the miracle. The land of the miracle. I want to be such a lad. Say, preacher, you're too old to be a lad. All right, I'm an old lad. What was it the 105-year-old lady said when he said, how do you, what's the best thing about being 105? And she said, no peer pressure. <laughs> I want to be that lad. Look at the lad of the miracle in our text. Verse number six, and this he said to prove him, for he himself knew what he would do. Philip answered, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them, for everyone to take a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, saith unto him, There is a lad. What's the next word? Here. Here. He didn't say there's a lad I met in town last week. No, he said there's a lad here. 
a land here, which has five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? So as we think about the land of the miracle, we find his presence to give. His presence to give. He was there. He was there. And I put that as, as, as identifying character. He just had to be there. You know, one of the great things about, one of the simple things of teaching character is being where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be. Yeah. Being where you're supposed to be, when you're supposed to be, doing what you're supposed to be, the way you're supposed to be doing it, and with the right attitude. That is character. And so here it was, he was present to give. He had to be there. He said, we have a lad here. And so he was just being present. One of the great things we can first do when we want to be that lad of the miracle, when we want to have God use us, where all may be filled, that all can take as much as they want, that all may hear, we just got to start showing up. Showing up. That's the very first step, just being there. So he was present. He was present to give. But not just present to give, we find his presentation to give. He, he had his lunch. He gave up his lunch. He offered his lunch. It's like the prophet said, here am I, send me. So we've got to be present. But guess what? There's a choice about a presentation. Presenting ourselves. There's a lot of times there is a lot of people present, but very few present. You've probably been there. You've been present, but you weren't presenting yourself. I'm present myself, but I'm not presenting myself. Let's present ourselves to the Lord. Yeah. Well, here am I, send me. Here's these lads. He said, preacher, how do you know he presented himself? Because there was 5,000 men there already, plus the other kids and plus the wives. He had, he had to come up and say, here, here, here I am. I got a lunch here. I heard what you were talking. I saw what your need was. Here I am. He presented. It's a choice. It's a choice to present ourselves. Say, preacher, I want to be like the lad. I want to be involved in this miracle. I want to see that all may know. I want, okay, be present and then present yourself. Say, here I am. Whatever the need is, I can do this. I can make the changes here. I can apply myself here. I can't do everything, but I can do something. Hello? Well, present. So let's present presentation. We find the lad, his presence. That's his character. His presentation. That's his choice. And then his pleasure, his pleasure to give. I may be reading a little bit between the lines, but I don't think, I don't picture the disciple one side of the basket and the lad on the other, and the disciple said, don't you want to give it? Don't you? No, I, yeah, I don't want to give it. I don't want to give it. No, I don't think it was a fight going on. I think if he wanted to keep his lunch, he'd have just kept his lunch. By the way, as I've preached many times before, I think lots of other people had lunches there that day. Out of 5,000 men, I just know men. They've got that base, ba bacon, egg, and cheese biscuit tucked down inside their shirt for breakfast, all right? They just have that. they got a little bit of a, the Dunkin' Donut thing going on somewhere down in their things. Hello. Oh, no, I'm sorry. This is California. They had baby carrots. But here's a lad who says, no, I've got a lunch. It was his pleasure to give. It was something that he wanted to give. It was his pleasure to give. Ladies and gentlemen, God wants us to give out of pleasure. God wants us to present ourselves out of pleasure. He does not want to force us. He does not want to make us begrudging. Because, see, if we don't do it in pleasure, then when the problems come, we'll be bitter and angry. When we feel overwhelmed, we'll get bitter and angry. Let's go ahead and make it our pleasure. It was his pleasure to give. You say, how can we have pleasure to give? I believe much like the young lad here. It shows his compassion. His compassion. Well, if we say, I want to be a blessing to somebody. I want to help somebody. I've got this, but they don't have anything. It's just compassion. Do we care about what we see? Jesus often, when he saw the multitude, was moved with compassion. It shows his compassion. It was pleasure to give. Why? Because he had compassion. And I believe also it shows confidence. Confidence in the Lord. Confidence that he was not going to die of hunger. Confidence that God was going to take care of him. Confidence that things were going to work out even if it meant he gave up his lunch. We just need that kind of confidence. If we're going to be used, we're going to see the miracles of God. If God is going to use us, a little church here in the middle of Pleasanton, this reach that all may know to bring a spiritual awakening to East Bay, we're going to have to have confidence as we give ourselves and pleasure to give ourselves and to give what we have that God has given us. 1 Corinthians fifteen fifty eight. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, 
For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. That's just faith in God. That's just confidence in what God says. So we present ourselves, God's going to take care of it. It's not going to be empty work. It's not going to be vain work. It's not going to be something God forgets. Little as much when God is in it. But he looks for us to give. He knew what he was going to do. By the way, I find it exciting. Since Jesus knew what he was going to do, he knew the lad was there. Which means he knew the lad was going to give it. I wonder if God knows if you're willing to give. By the way, he does know. Your willingness or my willingness or unwillingness. We find the Lord of the miracle. I'm glad it's all God. We find the lad of the miracle. Number three, we see the looks of the miracle. The looks of the miracle. Very quickly, these are simple thoughts on this verse number five. We find Jesus looked up and about. Look at verse five. When Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him. He looked up and saw the crowd. He looked up and saw the people. You know what's going to help us? Give that little bit as much in the hand of God. Is when our eyes are not glued to our cell phones. When our eyes are not glued to our iPads. When our eyes are not glued to the television or to games. It's an amazing thing. Let's look up and see people. Let's see people. That's what Jesus said. He looked up and around and he saw the multitude. Now, he knew they were there, but when he saw it, he posed the question. Let's look at people. People. I'm not going to sing it. People need the Lord. Like Gerber. Remember Gerber? Babies are our business. Our only... That's what I'm so mean. The old motto for Gerber was, babies are our business, our only business. That's what they said in that little Gerber baby. That was it. Babies are our business, our only business. Guess what? People are our business. And really our only business. God's left us here to reach people. So we've got to look at people. We've got to look at people. And so the first look is he looked up and about to saw the crowd. He saw a great company. And then he looked to heaven. Verse number 11, And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples. He paused to give thanks. Look to heaven. God's got to do it. So let's look at the people. Let's look at the needs. See who God has put in our path. And look to heaven. He said he gave thanks. No doubt he gave thanks for the bread. He gave thanks for the fish. But I think he probably also gave thanks for the little boy. Gave thanks for the opportunity. Gave thanks for the miracle that was about to happen. We give thanks for those who were going to be saved because of the miracle. Wow. Just give thanks. Give thanks. The looks just have the right look. Well, we, we look at the politics. Now, I enjoy politics. I like watching politics. I like reading about it. But I've got to make sure that I'm looking at people. Man. If we're going to have people take as much as they would. Very quickly notice the labors of the miracle. The labors of the miracle. And again, this is for us as a church. Look at verse number 11. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were sat down, and likewise of the fishes as much as they would. The labors, that's just the workers. That's just the disciples. They just got to be a part of the miracle. By the way, I want to be a part of the miracle. I want to be just, just a part of the miracles, just the labors. So many times Jesus gives parables about just the labors in the field, just the labors going out. Remember he went down, he went down and saw some folks at different hours of the day just standing around, says nobody's hired us. He said, go to the field, go to the field. We just get to be a labor for him, just a servant for the Lord Jesus Christ. So they were the labors. The disciples didn't do anything miraculous. The disciples didn't do anything supernatural. They just did what they were told. They got to be labors for the miracle. By the way, it takes labor. That's why we're, we're to pray for labors for the harvest. God says we're to pray. So let's be labors. Notice it was these labors 
God just knew the plan. It was a participatory plan. Participatory plan. They just got to participate. Aren't you glad we get to participate? We get to help. And I helped. Too many years ago. Shake and bake. Look what mama cooked. And I helped. You know we get to go to heaven. I think that's. It will be all God. But we get to say. And I helped. That's why the Apostle Paul said, Are not ye even my crown of rejoicing? Standing before Jesus Christ. And I helped. I didn't do much, but I helped. Acts 1.8 But ye shall receive power after, the, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and all Judea and in Samaria and the uttermost part of the earth. He says, you're going to go out. You get to go out. He says, I've got the power. The Holy Spirit is going to come upon you and you will go out. We get to participate. We ought to participate. It ought to be a joy for us to participate. So, oh, preacher makes us participate. No, it's a joy. Labors for the miracle. They got to pass it out. It was participatory plan. Number two, it was a pronounced or prescribed plan. A pronounced or a prescribed plan. They didn't choose it themselves. God says, had them sit down. Jesus said, had them sit down. He said, I'm giving it to you and you pass it out. It was their plan. I'm glad God's got a plan. God's got a plan for reaching the lost world. God's got a plan for seeing people saved. God's got a plan. And we just get to participate in that prescribed plan. Matthew 28, 18. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Amen. And so he's got the plan. He says, you go and preach and teach and baptize, and then you go teach them to do the same thing. That's God's plan. God's plan is for us to get saved, to be taught the Word of God, how to see other people saved, and go do the same thing to them. That's God's plan. God had it before Amway had it. You go win somebody and teach them, and then they go win somebody and teach them, and while they're doing that, you're winning somebody else and teaching them, and it just goes from that. God's got the plan. It's a pronounced plan. That's how we're supposed to do it. Acts 20, 20. How I kept back nothing that was profitable unto you, but have showed you and taught you publicly and from house to house, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. We talk about having 2020 vision. Acts 20, 20. Taught you publicly and from house to house, but don't forget 21, testifying both to the Jews and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith to our Lord Jesus Christ. The plan is that we've got the power of God by the Holy Spirit, and we go out publicly and house to house. And we give and preach about Jesus Christ, repentance to God's got the plan. So let's just do the plan. Let's work the plan God has given to us. Amen. Just labors. He said, here's the bread. He says, you take the baskets and you go do the job and you spread it out. The labors of the miracle. I get to be one of the labors of the miracle. Very quickly, the leftovers of the miracle. The leftovers of the miracle. Somebody once said they were so poor, all they started with was leftovers. The leftovers. Verse number 12. Verse number 11. And Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, and disciples to each of them that sat down, and likewise of the fishes as much as as they would. And when they were filled, well, they just said, I just can't have any more. I just can't eat anymore. There's just no more room. And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore they gathered them together and filled twelve baskets with the fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. There was leftovers. The leftovers of the miracle, what that shows is sufficiency. God's sufficiency for us. Taking that little bit, aren't you glad he's sufficient? Aren't you glad it's enough? It is sufficient as much as they would. I'm glad God's got that kind of power. I'm glad God's got... We have to believe that. He said, well, we're just a small church. Yes, but God takes little things and does great works when we're willing to give what he's given to us unto him joyfully. He can take the miracle and spread it out and he's got all the sufficiency needed. Oh, 
not just sufficiency, but we also see a superabundance. A superabundance. Not only... See, we, we would doubt his ability if the end of the story there says, and everybody ate all they would, and everything was gone. We'd say, sure. Sure, they had all they wanted. But they had more than when they started. Super abundance. Super abundance. God is able to do it. That's why it says in 2 Corinthians 9, 8, and God is able to make all grace abound towards you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. God doesn't use superlatives just to make it sound good. He's saying, he says, and God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, always having all sufficiency in all all things may abound to every good work. Ephesians 3.20 Now unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. I'm glad his leftovers in a miracle. There was just plenty. I don't have to worry if God's got enough power. I don't have to worry if God can take this church. I don't have to worry if God can take me and do something marvelous through us because he's got all the power. Very quickly notice the legacy of the miracle. The legacy of the miracle. Verse 14. So you say, well, it was a miracle, but notice verse 14. Then those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, when they saw the miracle, when they saw the lad that had given, when they saw the labors that did as they were told, when they saw the Lord posing the problem, said, this is of a truth. That prophet that should come into the world. You say, what does that mean? They said, truly, that's the Messiah. Truly, that's the Messiah. Deuteronomy 18, 15. Because see, they knew. What they were referring to is back in Deuteronomy where it says, The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet, capital P, from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me, Unto him ye shall hearken. He said, I come to Moses, there's going to come a prophet, capital P. So when they saw that, they said, he's that prophet. He is the Messiah. He is the Son of God. He is the one. In other words, he got, they got saved. They believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They recognized him as the Messiah. That's the purpose of the miracle. Yeah, it was to show God's power. Yes, it was to be a blessing to people. Yes, it was to test faith. But when it comes down to it, the legacy of it was people being saved. The legacy of it was people knowing who Jesus Christ is. So tonight, as we look at that passage, as much as they would, as much as they would, that all may know. You can plug that into so many areas of your life, but tonight I'm just focused on tonight as a church. Lighthouse Baptist Church, little group here. If we'll all just be the lad. If we understand, we say, well, pre preacher, I'll, I'll do that, but i got problems. Guess what? we all got problems. All God's children have got problems. We don't understand. I, I have a busy schedule. we all got busy schedules. We don't understand. I'm, I'm, I'm poor. <laughs> but he's not. Let's decide to have a part that all may know. And so folks can have as much as they would. Let's bow our heads, please.